welcome again. We are approaching the office of Maury Obstfeld at the Economics Department of Berkeley University, California. Professor Obstfeld is the recipient of the 2003 John von Neumann Award of Rye College. As we greet each other, he enthusiastically runs down the hall to show us the picture of the renowned Hungarian economist Janos Harsányi. I'm Maury Obstfeld. I'm a professor at Berkeley, also a fellow of the Peterson Institute, and I work on open economy, macroeconomics, and finance. The professor is well known for his work on open macroeconomics. He briefly introduced the idea to us, also putting it into historical context. And the field of open economy macroeconomics is uh, engaged in an important learning process. Uh, so is all of macroeconomics and monetary theory um, as a result of the global financial crisis when macroeconomics was taken pretty much unaware by the set of uh, events in financial markets that brought the world economy down. Um, the tools developed are useful, but we certainly need new tools and need very much the insights from finance. And one of the, one of the uh, ongoing research agendas is to integrate those financial tools and an understanding of the fine structure of financial markets, the transmission mechanisms for policy through those markets with our conventional macro models. That's still a work in progress. Keynes's program uh, for escaping recession and saving capitalism from depression was uh, basically focused on what national governments could do at the national level. Um, and he, he believed for part of the 1930s that the best way for them to carry out these experiments was in the presence of some barriers to international capital flows and possibly even to international trade. I think by the end of the 1930s, he had changed his views. Uh, and the evidence for that is his role in helping to um, set up the infrastructure for the Bretton Woods system, uh, the mandate of which was to uh, restore um, uh, a vibrant international economy. The Eurozone faced various crises in the last decade. We discussed the potential for a more centralized banking system, as well as the role of Eastern European countries might play in it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there, there are some very complex political issues uh, because there is a divergence between, you know, sort of northern, generally northern so-called Hanseatic countries, which um, are um, worried about sharing risks with um, countries that they view as having weaker economic governance. Um, and um, countries such as France and others which would like to have more of a centralized fiscal, fiscal function. Um, I do think the Eurozone needs uh, some sort of centralized fiscal capacity. Um, they need a common uh, deposit insurance fund to complete the banking union. Uh, I think there ultimately needs to be um, some sort of uh, um, European-wide bond that is issued by the fiscal authority. Uh, but I think it also has to be the case that um, countries that get into trouble because of fiscal malfeasance can credibly default without huge spillovers to, uh, to the rest of the Eurozone. And that really requires a very strong, seamless banking union and I believe some, some more centralized fiscal capacity. You need, you, need, you, need to, you need to move closer to a model where uh, banks are euro area banks. They're not Greek banks, they're not you know, Italian banks, they're not French banks. I think we're, we're sort of in a, in a difficult period um, with respect to the relationship between uh, um, you know, the uh, sort of Western European countries who tend to be in the euro area and you know, Hungary, Poland, you know, part, part of this is, is political, just the move to more sort of populist, um, maybe authoritarian uh, models in those countries, which is um, uh, sort of contrary to the direction the EU had hoped to, to pull them. Um, there aren't so many uh, disagreements about basic economics. I don't think these, any of the Eastern European, the large Eastern European countries are particularly eager to 
joined the Euro um, uh, and um, I think I think it's understandable that um, one would hesitate to give up the extra degree of freedom that the exchange rate allows. Um, and in general, uh, policy has been pretty good, pretty good, pretty sound in these in these countries. So I don't see a huge reason to uh, think about entering the euro at this point. But there is this general um, friction over politics, and also a friction. Uh, probably the major the major fault line regards um, the uh, uh, you know the the. Uh, migration issue and the mobility of people within within the EU. I would say for, for, you know, particularly for the Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary, it's really a difficult time politically in terms of relations with Brussels. A clash which might shake the whole world economy is the US-China trade war. The professor showed us the more detailed dimensions to approach the matter. Well, I think the US has been involved in trade war on multiple fronts, not just against China, although China is the biggest trading partner. And, um, uh, you know, at some level, the, uh, you know, the most systemic trading partner, uh, and it's the area where the aggression has been most pronounced up until now. Um, the China relationship is, is particularly fraught, though, because there's also a high degree of um, conflict uh, with China or a potential conflict, uh, or if conflict isn't the right word, at least competition, uh, I think, is, is a safe word, along numerous dimensions. Geopolitics is one dimension, uh, so there's military competition, uh, there's competition over territory, territorial influence, there's competition over soft power, uh, throughout the world, uh, you know, including in Africa, including in uh, Latin America. Uh, there is competition over um, technological supremacy, which we see in the um, dispute over Huawei and the U.S. efforts to persuade um, other countries not to make uh, Huawei a, a technology a fundamental component in their 5G development. Um, and there's competition more broadly in technology as China, uh, you know, aspires to develop um, uh, new technologies and be at the cutting edge of technological advancement in the future, including things like uh, space travel. So um, this is not something that's going to go away because uh, China comes and promises to buy a few more soybeans from the United States. I mean, it's really deep, fundamental conflict over um, global influence and uh, you know whether the US can continue to be a global a global hegemon and you know as I see it the US is 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 not doing the right things to um, to win this competition because um, uh, the the um, current US administration is really very focused on short run wins or, or short run uh, uh, publicity over uh, agreements that can be portrayed as wins and not doing the kinds of investments in U.S. capacity that would really enable it to maintain its competitive edge. And those would include investments in infrastructure, um, investments in science and education, uh, which are things that the Chinese have done uh, in um, uh, significant magnitudes. Uh, but there, there's a, there's a longer-term negative effect uh, by making less credible and undermining the multilateral institutions of trade dispute resolution uh, in WTO that have been developed, and which help to to some degree to limit uncertainty. Uh, there's a huge amount of uncertainty about where the global economy and trading system are heading, and even though there's some short-term relief about uh, the U.S.-China phase one trade deal or the passage of the U.S. Uh, revised North American uh, trade area, um, the conflicts and the uncertainty are going to continue and they're hurting everyone in the world. We learned how to look at the job of the IMF chief economist as being the perfect playground for a kid who loves science 
and public issues. Well, the, the IMF chief economist in principle has um, a couple of roles. Um, it's, I think for an economist, for a macroeconomist, it's, it's like the best job in the world because um, the areas where, where we sort of pioneered, I think, was in uh, climate, uh, um, macro effects of climate change. This is something that started before I got there, but we continued it, um, thinking about inequality more systematically, and also um, thinking hard about international trade and the macro uh, uh, aspects of international trade. And this is something we started before the Trump administration came in because we were concerned with the slowdown in global trade that we were seeing. But then once the sort of trade war um, broke out, that kind of work became very, very relevant. <laughs> Um, you know, um, I think it's, uh, you know, partly personality and, uh, you know, being just basically a sort of nerdy, nerdy person. I don't know how you say nerdy in Hungarian, but I'm sure there's a word that <laughs> you can translate. But, um, you know, I mean, in fact, I was, I was, uh, I, w I was always kind of bimodal in my interests. I mean, on the one hand, I was a major in mathematics in college, but I also worked on the school newspaper, which was a very sort of public-facing, politically involved kind of activity. And, um, you know, I eventually felt that, that working as an academic economist, I would be able to um, sort of merge these two aspects of my uh, interests, both by doing research, but also trying to uh, sort of use this research to, um, you know, improve policy making and communicate with a broader public. So, you know, for me, that was that was kind of a sweet spot in terms of, uh, 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 you know, where I, I I wanted to find myself. And I feel very fortunate that I've had the opportunity to both, you know, have great academic colleagues, but also have you know fantastic colleagues in the policy world at the IMF, uh, you know, in the U.S. administration and elsewhere. Thank you.